Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume in September of 2021 here in our home city of New York for the first time. But that goal is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Nina Burley to SALT Talks. Uh, Nina Burley is a national journalist and author, most recently of Virus, Vaccinations, the CDC, and the Hijacking of America's Response to the Pandemic, in addition to many other uh, best-selling books. That's her most recent book, obviously, uh, which is highly relevant today. Uh, she's most recently covered America under Donald Trump as a national politics correspondent at Newsweek. Uh, she got her start in journalism covering the Illinois State House in Springfield and has reported from almost every state in the continental, continental U.S. and has been based in Italy, France, and the Middle East. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner at Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Well, Nina, first of all, congratulations on the book. Uh, I'm going to hold it up here. I like holding up the book of my friends. Virus, vaccinations, the CDC, and the hijacking of America's response to the pandemic, which is obviously one of the tragedies of our time. Uh, the book is fascinating. It's a quick read, uh, but you really go into all of the things that we did wrong. So before we get there, though, tell us a little more about your background. You're, 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 you're talking to us from your friend's kitchen in beautiful Michigan. You're from Michigan, right? Tell us where you're from and tell us how you grew up. Well, uh, first of all, I have to correct um, our millennial on the pronunciation of my name. It's Burley, like a football player, not Burley. Good. Good. I love um, the fact that you corrected him. Okay, thank you. Because, because I, let me tell you something. He gets fan mail and I don't get any <laughs> fan mail. So I just have to tell you, I'm very happy. I, I split the difference. Burley. I started Burley and then I said, maybe it's it's Burley. I, and by the uh, way, I noticed you got did all that. of these like names like <laughs> Chamal, Amambitaya, Mugaba, ba, 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 and he's like always pronouncing it perfectly and I'm stumbling over myself. So I'm I'm very joyous right now. Continue, Nina, please. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, so it's Nina Burley. I am uh, a um, uh, Midwestern, born and bred, and um, I grew up in, uh, as uh, Anthony said, um, spent lots of my childhood here in Southern Michigan, um, and uh, played a lot in the woods, and learned to swim here, and learned to uh, hang out at the library, because there was nothing to do, so it kind of started me off on my writing career. Um, I have strong roots here. And then the Midwest, I, I got um, started in journalism, as, as, at, at, as you said, at the Associated Press in Springfield, Illinois, when, when state capitals still had state houses filled with press rooms with lots of media, um, you know, and uh, especially Springfield being one of the big states like Albany, uh, tons of corruption, um, lots of competing interests, and they're microcosms of what's going on in Washington. So I really got a strong grounding in, I think, covering and understanding the issues of our time as they were developing. I was I go all the way back to the uh, the Reagan years, and um, in my view, uh, that um, that period really was the turning point for a lot of things in our country, including. Um, you know, how labor was treated, the unions started to go down, and this kind of growing, um, you know, kind of disrespect for, for expertise, especially scientific knowledge uh, by the industries, because industry, of course, wanted to um, make sure that, let's say, if you were uh, R.J. Reynolds, that there would be competing, um, uh, competing voices against the notion that tobacco and that cigarettes cause cancer. And then, you know, of course, after that, you get to the climate change um, era, which we're in now, in which companies like Exxon have uh, bankrolled these, these kind of contrarian scientists who will speak up for the 3% of the scientific community that thinks the climate change is not uh, happening and is not a cause caused by fossil fuels. So this is stuff that's been in my um, kind of in my purview as covering politics um, 
over the last couple of decades. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And I can, I could talk on at length about my career, but let's um, whatever you want to discuss, Anthony, I'm, I'm game. All right. Well, let's go right to the book then. Okay. The book virus, it's a brilliant story of the science of the virus and the history of vaccines and treatments. Uh, and, you know, you and I know each other, you were on Mooch FM with me and we were talking about the phenomenon in the last 150 years as a result of vaccines, we've extended our lifespan, we're living healthier, and people are taking this for granted. Why do you think 25% of the adult population are vaccine deniers? And by the way, my wife gets very mad at me, I might add, because some of her friends are actually college educated and will not take the vaccine. And I look at them like they're imbeciles, and she gets very mad at me. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, you know what? That is, that, but that that observation uh, is very um, important. What you've just said, because when we think of you know science deniers, we think of like rubes and the rabble and people who got you know didn't get very low information uh, voters and people who will believe conspiracy theories over science and so on. And we kind of think, tend to think that they maybe aren't as educated. And in fact. That 25 percent, Anthony, um, a significant a percentage of it, maybe not the majority, but a percentage of it certainly is among the educated uh, kind of I, I call them like the granola crunchy educated people. I've got friends in my circle like that, too, where you, they won't say they aren't taking the vaccine because they know it's not cool, but you can tell they're, where they're at because they won't say anything when you're talking about the vaccine. They kind of go silent and look a little sheepish. And those are the people who believe that. Um, you know, chemi- chemistry or chemical, you know, man-made things are not as healthy as natural things. And the answer to that, and for my book, I interviewed people who are sort of in this world of um, medicine and the culture of science and society, is um, the answer is, uh, look, chemi- everything you eat is made of chemistry and chemicals. Bananas are chemical. And so, uh, and, and everything has genetic material in it. And uh, so that's the answer to them. You don't have to be chemophobic uh, to take, you know, to, to look at the world. So, and so that's one segment of the of it. It's not, maybe not the largest group, but it is a significant percentage. The other are, you know, low information, um, low information populations. Um, you know, again, the low information populations in the, in the, um, uh, white communities in the South, let's say, and some urban areas, Black and Latino, you know, there are very low vaccination rates among Blacks and Latinos in, I think, in New York still, unfortunately. Um, and then sort of over all of this, the big umbrella is that uh, you have or had a leader and have leaders still in, political elected leaders in the House and the Senate and of course, the former guy I'm talking about, who's not a leader, no, he's in a, is a leader in name still, though we, I don't think he's much of a leader. He doesn't exercise leadership. He is de facto a leader um, who persist in uh, de- refusing to correct, to lead their people and to say to correct these, these pieces of misinformation and to say, you know what, this is actually really good. And in fact, I got it. And so did my children. And I'm talking about uh, the former guy. Um, They won't step up for science. They don't want to step up for science because part of their MO, and I guess we can talk about the whole Republican Party behaving this way at this point, is to inject doubt into the fact-based world so that you can continue to um, press uh, on with a big lie like the election lie. OK, so uh, so that, you know, we're talking about the, this distrust, uh, just the scorn for expertise that, you know, there's always been kind of that stream in American in Americans. Americans are, you know, we're DIY, we're common sense, you know, ride right off in the sunset with the horse. I can fix it myself. Um, that's a myth. But, you know, the 2016 election, the 2015 election really brought into the light this world of alternative information that people were living by and literally making just life decisions on. And I can talk about some of the people I met at the Republican National Convention in 2016 who 
whose decision-making process was based on such false information that I almost wanted to stop. I, I, I almost wanted to stop reporting and start correcting them because I was worried about them. But I didn't understand where these, where these, where these streams of mis and disinformation were coming from. And the virus descends upon America at a point in time when we have this phenomenon of, um, you know, disinformation, misinformation, silos of information, and this giant challenging of facts that's going on everywhere. And the, the refusal of people to, to agree on a fact-based reality. And my book is, I think, what I tried to do was memorialize what they did, how this came about, what the last administration did and didn't do, and, and then also to really celebrate the science, the triumph of science here in the face of all this, that we then got this man-made miracle of a vaccine that's enabled us all to walk around without masks now. So let's set the record straight, just as you make it very clear in the book, how successful have vaccines been in the modern era? Okay, so vaccines have been, I mean, we've, we've, we've had vaccine, the vaccine, the first vaccine comes around 250 years ago. It was for, it was for the smallpox. Before 250 years ago, and throughout the entire history of the human species, we had no defense against infectious diseases, nothing, only luck. Or, you know, you could pray to your God, or you could, um, you could wear garlic, or, you know, you could, you're, it was sheer luck and supernatural um, belief. And, and, and then this vaccine comes along 250 years ago, they start to fight off, um, they start to be able to defend against smallpox. And then in the next century, microscopes get invented and humans begin to be able to understand, oh, there are these tiny little things that are in the bodies of cholera victims and two tuberculosis victims. And gee, maybe we can, you know, attenuate those and you make, make, you know, use those as a way to similar to the cowpox smallpox vaccine. Um, what doesn't kill you will make you immune. So they would, would put these dead or, or weakened viruses and bacteria into people. And that was the vaccine. That is essentially what the platform of the vaccine has been up until this year. Um, and then, you know, we have the, the 20th century where the, the developments of vaccines become more and more rapid, more and more um, uh, uh, effective and also mass produced. And, you know, the first big mass, mass vaccination program in the United States, the polio um, vaccination program in the 50s, which they unfortunately hit a hiccup. They one of the companies made a bad batch and they actually injected live virus into kids. And that is one of the streams of, of vaccine that, that provokes one of the streams of vaccine distrust that exists to this day. Um, the vaccine vaccine technology or vaccines have, like all science, that it, it moves forward in sort of fits and starts. You know, science is not a it's not perfect. It is you you experiment. And as the data comes in, you alter your um, understanding. So vaccinations throughout the 20th century are a history of these leaps forward accompanied by, um, you know, margin on the margins, um, side effects that were scary um, or, you know, ineffective vaccines. But overall, Anthony, and this is what we talked about before on your on your show, overall, they have been a massive success story. And we can see that in, if you were born in 1900, your lifespan in America was 48 and 49 for men and women. It's now like 80, right? So we've doubled our lifespan. Now, of course, some of those, some of it has to do with um, antibiotics and the type of food we eat, but most of it, a huge percentage of it has to do with the fact that we now have these vaccines that protect children from diseases, the names of which we can't even pronounce anymore, that used to wipe out or cause traumatic illness that people would remember for a lifetime if they survived it in children. And now we don't have that. So what's happened is we have people walking around like your friends who are like, I don't think I need the vaccine. It's not organic enough. And my friends who are that, but even educated people walking around going, eh, I don't, you know, 
I think I think I'll decide whether I want to do this or not because it doesn't seem like such a bit because we're spoiled. We actually don't know what's on the other side of this shield that modern medical science has created for us. You, I want to go to the politics again for a second. As you're mentioning, uh, um, it's a weird thing. The former administration wants to take credit for Operation Warp Speed. And the supporters of that administration want to take credit for it. Yet a very large block of those supporters do not want the vaccine. So I don't understand that at all. I can't get my arms around that. I was wondering if you could help me with that. Go ahead. No, Anthony, you know, I, I'm this, sometimes we get in conversations about the, the supporters of the former guy and, and we all just start to sputter in, in, um, in, mis- in incomprehension because we, there's no logic to it. Um, there's no logic to this blind following of the leader except for accepting that people do follow leaders blindly. And I guess that's what's going on here because they have turned off the rational, logical side of the brain. And they're just giving into this emotional uh, reaction to this guy who's, whose behavior and, and, and statements they seem to admire so much. And so, uh, no, they should get some credit for um, Operation Warp Speed. I mean, they definitely, you know, Operation Warp Speed was they threw billions of dollars at these pharma companies and they said, you, 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 and you, and you. They picked six of them. No bid contracts, kind of non-transparent, but hey, it was an emergency. And they said, we're going to give you the money, whether it works or not. Make a lot of it. If it works, if it doesn't work, you're still going to get to keep the money. And by the way, we're going to shield you from litigation. So uh, it worked. It worked great. They made the. They made this. You know, it, it is a medical milestone. Now they had been. This had been on the drawing board for about 15 years, but in in medicine in America, the FDA has to approve things. And they, these clinical trials can take years. They call it the valley of death for in the medical world. And they, they bumped it into uh, to warp speed and yay, it worked. The problem was they did that, but they weren't going to be able to, to um, distribute it widely because the ideology of the former administration that held sway in their actions was that government should be shrunk to the size of a pinhead they had, attend, they had weakened the agencies and that they didn't really want to activate all the levers of government. They didn't want people to see, oh, you know, the government can, can do this for you because they preferred that it be shown that private enterprise can do the job just as well. So let, let's go to the malpractice that took place, the public policy malpractice and the how many lives could have been saved and what were some of the big missteps at the beginning of the pandemic that you write about in the book? Sure. Well, OK, we know from Deborah Burks, who was one of the administration uh, top officials in this is- issue, that um, she has said this uh, since not being in the administration, that 100,000 Americans was probably what the number should have been in terms of how many people would, were going to die of this. Instead, we're closing in on 600,000. Um, something went wrong. What was it? Um, I think, you know, the early missteps were, as we know, the, um, well, the, the, the greatest mi- misstep, the malfeasance that lasted throughout the year was that they put public relations above public health. He liked the numbers low. I like the numbers low. Remember that? That's what he said. I like the numbers low. He didn't want to test people. He didn't want to bring the cruise ship in off the coast of California. He said that in relation to increase the numbers of people. Yeah. But he did it. He said it also at a, when he, the context of that comment had to do with the they were at the CDC, and this is actually how I opened my book, this incredible scene where he's standing there with the MAGA hat and he's making up these numbers like, well, four million tests are going to be available to people in the, at the end of the week. And there was no such thing. There were not going to be four million tests. And then in the same press conference, because he has like Tourette's syndrome and he blurts out whatever he thinks, which is kind of great because you can track what is going on. He said, I like the numbers low. I don't want those sick people coming off that clinic, uh, that um 
at uh, cruise ship out there, out there and put them in. So we'll have higher numbers of COVID. Well, it, COVID was already stalking the streets and, and rooms and homes and hospitals and nursing homes of New York state by then. And there were no tests to stop it. So that's the number one, that was the first error and the first really preventable error. And then you had the masks issue, which um, they can share the blame for that with the WHO and other top officials because they were early on, the doctors were not, they were worried about running out of uh, masks themselves. So they were saying, don't wear masks. And they didn't fully understand that this is a, an airborne virus and that masks really do help. So they were like, eh, don't wear them. And then, and then when they changed their mind, you know, those who are opposed to any kind of government um, restrictions related to this crisis, seized on that as a, hey, you know what, look, they don't know what they're talking about. And again, that's, that's, you know, people don't understand how science works. The doctors thought that it was not airborne and that you didn't need it. And then they realized it was, well, then they told you to, to do it. So uh, you either have a science person in the White House standing next to you who respects that and who can explain it. And it is easily explained. Or you have somebody like a man in a red hat on TV every night going, Look, the scientists don't really know what they're talking about. You know, I, I, I know what's going on. And by the way, I'm not going to wear one. You know, they tell you to wear one, but I don't think I'm going to wear one. You know, and that's not leadership. He was a leader, but he wasn't acting, acting as a leader. What do you think the big lessons were from all of this? Oh, boy. Um, well, the big lessons are, you know, hopefully that you have somebody in the White House. Look, this is the richest country in the world. We are we are equipped to deal with these types of things. We have experts all over. What you needed was somebody in the White House who had a, a scientist on speed dial who could activate what was needed. And he didn't, you know, he puts Mike Pence, evangelical, uh, in charge of the COVID response. Burks, Redfield, Azar, the head of the HHS, these are evangelical Christians, Anthony. They're not you know, not that they're not, you know, well, Azar is a pharma uh, exec, not, but the other two were actually medical people, but they're event, ultimately they're, they, you know, they will call on the supernatural. And in, in the end, you needed somebody to, like what they've put in there today. There's this, uh, what Biden, a guy that, the, sorry, the science advisor to Biden is an expert in genetic science. Genetic science is the future. Genetic science has in leaps and bounds in the last two decades begun to change how medicine is it works and this mrna vaccine is the first sort of widely experienced example or fruit of all of that knowledge but it's really hard to understand for the average person it's like a, it's like a separate language i mean i had a i had a microbiology phd student at stanford helping me with this book just to keep talking to me doing genetics for dummies because it's really hard to understand when you start looking at it you can kind of visualize it dna rna made of proteins um, on a strand but it's hard to understand it and so you need somebody who really knows what it is and knows what these things are and knows how to speak in, the, in that language. And then you need somebody who respects that and says to that person, you you tell the public, you know, or, or you tell me what I need to tell the public. And then you tell the public what the scientists and the medical community are telling you. And that's number one. And, um, and number two, what would be another um, lesson? I mean, to me, that's the first lesson. I think the second lesson is this has to be a global response. We're not there yet, but you know, we again were the first generation of human beings who carry these things around with us. Every single one of us on this understands using this this little machine we have in our pocket that every other human being on the planet was experiencing the same thing that we were experiencing in real time. We could see that. We can see it right now. We can click on and see what's going on in India or in, in Africa. It's, it's in real time. We have so much data and so much information that we can't really walk away from this moment without re recognizing that we're a linked species. We are one species on this planet. And if we can't have a global response to something like this was a global catastrophe, like an asteroid hitting us or like cl climate change. If you don't start thinking in global terms, 
about responding to challenges like this, you're not going to get out of them. You're down. You're always going to be down in the ditch with the lowest, uh, the lowest, you know, the weakest. Well, you know, one of the one of the problems is, as you talk about a global response, it, and this feeds the conspiracists. This feeds the yep. you, you know, normal people in the establishment can make mistakes. As an example, the WHO, the World Health Organization, this probably wasn't its shining moment. Yep. Talk a little bit about that and your assessment of it in the book. Well, um, you mean about the who or about just this yeah. sort of sense of um, yeah, it didn't cover the, itself or the paranoia more. about global. About well, the there's global a combination of things going on. The, the the who had some missteps. They had some missteps yeah. related to China. They had some missteps related to the protocols, and then that fuels the conspiracy. Even though they were perhaps let's call them honest missteps, as we were yes. trying to understand what was going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the UN, UNICEF the UNHCR, the WHO, all of these global bodies represent to a certain segment of Americans who supported the former guy, this sensation of our national entity is crumbling. The walls are crumbling. We're no longer a nation. We're now this part of this, this world government. And, you know, I re- I'm old enough to remember when they were paranoid about black helicopters flying over uh over, you know, Wyoming that might be coming from the UN. And um, so, you know, this stream of paranoia remains very strong. And the the former guy provoked it. He also attached himself to it. They immediately, when they got in there, immediately started disengaging from these world bodies. They got out of a bunch of them before, you know, even before the virus, they were disengaging from from UNICEF and, and complaining about the UN taking too much money and so on. And then, uh, the WHO, you know, here comes this crisis that is a health, public health crisis. It's a global pandemic. And they fail to, um, first of all, to get this um, this mask thing straight. They are giving mis, mis- uh, or inconclusive sort of information um, and they are slow to respond. I mean, the whole China thing, um, you know, the government, our government thought that there was something uh fishy about the Wuhan lab. They had been getting information for years that the biosafety maybe wasn't particularly up to snuff from their people over there. And so they immediately seized on that because you had this sinophobic, you know, Peter Navarro and Pompeo and these people who had been just banging these drums about the Chinese and we need to stand up to the Chinese. And so they did not like the way the WHO went along with what the Chinese were saying about what was happening. And I, to, the, to their credit, I mean, the Chinese did release the genome quickly. They did admit that there was something going on in January. Um, was it happening there earlier? I don't know. Um, you know, they claim that there were some some sick uh, lab uh, workers, but we have seen no proof of that yet. The point is, the globalization of the world is inescapable. We can't... We the reason this thing is a pandemic is because we are linked there. Everyone is on airplanes all the time. Um, You know, the supply chains are messed up from COVID because we are so into, there are ships sitting in ports over in, you know, uh, I don't know, Portugal or, or, you know, China or Italy that can't go anywhere because there have been people locked down. So we are completely inter interrelated. And um, you know, I, I get why people object to, let's say, the the way the Chinese government operates, the authoritarianism, the the um, the, you know, intrusiveness of their I mean, they they locked down and they did get rid of their pandemic in a month or two. It was back to normal because of these extreme bio surveillance measures that they instituted, which we would never put up with here. I get that. But I think that when you're faced with a pandemic or global challenges, we need leaders who will sit down with other leaders and put that kind of thing aside and go, let's, you know, let's move on and let's talk about what we can do together to protect ourselves. And one of those things is let's all get together and share this vaccine. And I think, you know, that Biden trying to approach the patent issue, um, you know, it's weak. He's not going to get around. They're not going to get around it because there's so much money in pharma but people have to come together and look at this. And I know it sounds Pollyanna-ish and like singing Kumbaya and so on, but 
sooner or later, we have to ad- admit that we are one planet, one world, and it's very small. It's very small. We can have wars all the time and we can fight over, you know, borders and so on. But these types of, of species wide challenges, we need leadership that will look at that and be willing to negotiate and compromise and work together on these types of issues. Well, I really appreciate it, Nina. I'm going to turn it over to John, who has questions from our audience and his own questions. And the, the title of the book, Virus Vaccinations, the CDC and the Hijacking of America's Response to the Pandemic. It's a great read, great investigatory uh, research in it. And with that, I'll turn it over to John, uh, who is now learned how to pronounce your name, Nina, which Thanks, makes Anthony. me very happy. <laughs> Nina Burley. It's a beautiful name, and, and I'm proud to, to now be able to pronounce it Thank correctly. You, uh, but you you talked about mRNA vaccines, and you know, thankful uh, we should all be thankful for the fact that there was this intersection between research that had been taking place on mRNA vaccines for the flu vaccine, for cancer research, and the perfect application for the coronavirus pandemic. Could you talk about the future of mRNA vaccines and just the potential that they have unleashed in terms of Uh, vaccinations and treating a wide variety of of diseases? I I read a lot about it. I think in the book, I address it a little bit. I mean, in terms of um, the possibility, they're even talking about the possibility that this could sort of deal with the common cold. Um, But it is, uh, it is a milestone. It's not as much of a milestone maybe as antibiotics, but it is up there with it because it's a synthetic you know, man-made little strand that's that they inject into your system and it's transient. It doesn't change your DNA. Transient means it dissolves, it goes away. All it, it doesn't does, make you grow like a third arm it's or not leg gonna change. It's not gonna make us grow a third arm. It's not gonna make your, you know, as my friend, kind of nutty friend, Naomi Wolf is running around saying it's changing women's menstrual cycles or, you know, they're, uh, other people are saying it's, uh, I got to get emails now because I had this piece in the Times, an op-ed piece. And if you put something in the Times, you get like these inc- this, this tsunami of responses because that's how many people are looking at it. And all the responses that were in- sent to my private email were from anti-vaccine people saying, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, um, I know that people are dying of this. And, you know, there's this sensation that, well, anyway, we could talk about that again more of the, these misinformation silos. But in general, uh, yeah, I, t- I talk about it a little bit. I read more about it. I didn't put it all in there. But yes, it's going to change because it, because it is a completely new platform. And when we say platform, we mean the previous one was attenuated virus or attenuated bacteria platform to this synthetic molecule, mRNA platform that changes, that tells your cells to make a response to a very specific uh, part of a virus or in, in, in general, they're gonna be able to do this again and again and again. They're gonna be able to do it with other viruses. If another pandemic comes along, if another virus or another imminent or threatening pan threaten, let's say hopefully they'll be able to stop it from becoming a pandemic because they will, they will be able to look at these, the genome and in this case, within three days of the Chinese sending the genome over, within three days, the NIH had this mRNA uh, figured out. They knew what they had to put in within three days. So I can envision at some point in the future, there will be factories that will be able to, you'll just be able to phone them up, AI will just turn it on and they'll start producing these vaccines within hours. Uh, you know, I can, I think that that's the future and it's, it's exciting and amazing and we should be optimistic about it. Yep. God willing. You, you talked about uh, your, your piece in the times created all this vitriol that got sent to your private email. And, and obviously that's unfortunate. Uh, but there's also an element on the, on the right side of this, the right wing media machine led by Fox news and other outlets that are even more extreme these days uh, are, are partly to blame for sowing doubt in the vaccines in uh, you know, the, the pandemic Absolutely. in general, calling it a hoax, things like that. How much of a role does that right wing media machine and social media, frankly, and the echo chambers it creates contribute to 
the circular nature of a lot of these unsubstantiated uh, conspiracy theories. I like the way you said circular because it just made me think of circular firing squad. And that's actually what they're doing because they're killing their own people who are watching and, and participating in this. Um, it's a huge part of it. I mean, I don't watch Fox News. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I when I turn it on now, um, I am just blown away because these, these people are, you know, Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram are not ignorant. And yet they're spewing this stuff out there to millions upon millions of people who take what they're saying as fact. So, you know, one night I had the TV on and I saw Laura Ingram just rattling on about faceless bureaucrats in Brussels telling us what to do. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, where are the people in Brussels telling us what to do? The people in Brussels haven't even gotten their out of their lockdowns yet. You know, this was us. We made this we made this vaccine here in America and our government put this out there and our governors were forced to do state by state responses, lockdown or not, because the federal government wouldn't step up. So where are the faceless bureaucrats in Brussels? I, you know, all of this. It, yes. The social media, uh, the um, the echo chamber, the siloed off information um, or misinformation. Um, it's dreadful. And I don't know what you're going to do about Fox. I really don't, because I think it's I think Roger Ailes, I always say this, Roger Ailes was the tumor and Fox News is the cancer that it's going to take a generation to get it to get cured of, because I don't know. I don't honestly don't know how they're going to get beyond this unless the government goes back to uh, uh, regulating that kind of information. And we don't live right. in that kind of society. So, you know, as a country, the United States has always prided itself on freedom. Uh, and sort of an extreme free ideology, as you write about in the book. And the pandemic sort of exposed some of the dangers of that. On the other hand, you have more authoritarian type societies, whether it be in China or other places that maybe were able to have a better pandemic response because of the heavy handedness uh, of the way the government operates. How do you find the balance between those two? Obviously, unfettered capitalism and the extreme free ideology that you talk about probably isn't practicable when you have to deal with situations like a global pandemic. But at the same time, people don't want, uh, you know, government so heavy handed in their lives the way it is in somewhere like China. So how do you find a balance between those two going forward? Well, it's tough. And that's why I'm a journalist and not a um, policymaker. <laughs> I'm not Ron Klain. I'm not Biden. Um, obviously, I'm not working for them or the, in that business. And I, uh, as I've covered them over the years, I've become more sympathetic to people who are in those situations. I used to just like to take pot shots at them and look at what they were doing wrong. And now I think it's really hard. That's a really hard question. Uh, my, you know, answer would be, um, you know, moderation in all things, try to find the middle road, um, you know, try to bring people back around to a fact-based reality. That's the main thing. Communications. Um, Do you think look, the pandemic is going to change global democracy you know, in the United States and elsewhere where you're going to see more government intervention, more government spending to? Well, I don't know. Of, uh, you know I, I think obviously that's happening here right now. I mean, the Biden administration has responded to being the opposite of, you know, the anti-government ideology of the former administration. Now it's, you know, let's throw as much money as, at this as we can. They're going macro. They're going to throw money at infrastructure. They're throwing money at the at the, you know, social services and so on. Um, we're not getting we're not getting M4A out of it, which they could have started to. But they they could have moved the ball on that, maybe. But um, but, you know, in this country, yes, we're swinging to the other side, at least for the moment. Let's see what happens in election 2022. But. I was just talking to some friends of mine, Norwegians and, and Swedes, and this, you know, what's going on there. I mean, those are societies where um, the, 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 the the people are much more trusting of each other. The, that was my, I lived over there uh, lecturing like the, the months before the pandemic I spent in Norway. And we talked a lot about government and, and democracy. And in those societies, the, one of the reasons they don't have the problems that we're having here, at least in terms of the rise of the right and this the the kind of breakdown of the demo, of the democratic process, is that people don't think that if the other side wins, they're going to be wiped out. 
Like they, there's a trust in your fellow citizens that, you know, we all are in this together. We want our country to thrive. Of course, now there is a rise. The right is rising in Germany and in Sweden, and they're having a crisis in Sweden. Um, and part of those crises have to do with the lockdowns and the Norwegians and the Swedes have reacted against the lockdowns. I mean, so is this and, and, and the French, you know, I mean, you see people were just they're just sick of it. They, they did start off saying, you know, we we're confident and that um, we're, Macron is going to, you know, they're going to figure this out. And so they for the first two lockdowns in Paris, people were, you know, dealing with it. But then they had rolling more and more lockdowns and people started to resist. So as far as the West and these Western democracies, um, it is a huge challenge to these leaders to figure out what to do. Right. I mean, we, if they don't have the vaccine, are they they're going to keep telling people the lockdown? We are not going to do biosurveillance the way the Chinese do it. Nobody would sit still for that. I don't think right. any of us would. Uh, last question I have for you is the pandemic had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Uh, and also there was uh, socioeconomic issues. You know, poorer people died and suffered more from from COVID than wealthier people, uh, as well as communities of color suffered more. Um, they're also among the most vaccine hesitant uh, communities of color, mm-hmm. frankly. Mm-hmm. Why did more people of color, first of all, die and, and suffer uh, from COVID-19? And, and how do we educate those portions of the population and build trust with them uh, in terms of accepting vaccines and the treatments that we need to, to mitigate these types of pandemics moving forward? Well, we know that the, uh, you know, poverty and um, diabetes and those types of comorbidities and obesity kind of go together. So there was a lot of that. Um, a lot of communities of color, people work on the front lines. We could all kind of leave our jobs and work from home. If you work at McDonald's or you work at a, a grocery store checkout, you can't just go and stay home. So they were on the front lines. And um, I mean, those are the, those are the main reasons they're, you know, they're frontline workers and they also had a lot of comorbidities. They also tended to work to live in multi-generational households. Um, and as far as the, the low information uh, or the misinformation that they, the distrust of the vaccine in communities of color, um, I think that can be addressed um, over time. I, I think the churches, you know, the pastors have to speak out and as people become, it's it's really something that has to be dealt with from inside the community, but with the help of, of um, you know, urging of, of um, you know, allies within the medical community. And I will add that I just saw today, I think it's in the Times, red states are COVID states now. They, they, they actually are mapping it and they can see that it's really rising in these red states. It's not rising in the blue states. It's going right. up in all of these pockets. It's it's absolutely correlative to the support of, of the former guy. And so uh, I think you're going to see that kind of tip a little bit. And I don't know what effect that's going to have on the 2022 election, but I think really the more that these small, smaller communities or these remote communities or these low information communities start to see that within their communities, oh my God, there's a refrigerated truck outside of our rural hospital, like in that Wisconsin town that the Times did it feature on a while ago, or suddenly all of these people in this little town that have been anti-mask are like in the, you know, being forklifted into refrigerated trucks right before their eyes. And I think if it has sad that it's come to that and didn't have, didn't have to come to that because if they're looking to their leader down there in Florida, their leader, all he has to do is stand up and say, get the vaccination and say it over and over. It would make such a difference. It's such a simple thing, right? He got the vaccine himself, but uh, refuses to encourage, he refuses to encourage his supporters to protect themselves in the same way he did. I think it's a perfect analogy uh, for his presidency. What about about all the Fox news hosts? They all got the vaccine. Uh, uh, Similarly, absolutely. It's very upsetting. Well, Nina, it's fantastic to have you on. Obviously, we love hosting these talks to educate people. And your book, I think, did a great job at just looking at the science, looking at the facts of the pandemic uh, and drawing a a series of conclusions. But it's also challenging, as you mentioned, uh, for policymakers to find that right balance in a country that values freedom and liberty the way we do in the United States, but to also uh, make sure we protect people and and protect the group. 
Uh, but thank you so much for coming on and doing this and helping to educate people. Thank you so much for having me. Nina, thank you. I'm holding up the book again, Virus Vaccinations, the CDC, and the Hijacking of America's Response to the Pandemic. Thank you again for being on Salt Talks. You're welcome. Take care, thank guys. You. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's SALT Talk with Nina Burley. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT Talks, you can access them on demand on our website at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called SALT Tube. And please spread the word about these SALT Talks in particular. We think these relating to public health and the pandemic are extremely important that people learn uh, if they're unfamiliar with the science of the vaccine or they're hesitant uh, to, to watch talks like this and learn. Uh, we're also on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at SALT Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And on behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon.